pretty much everyone who has done something very, very important in C++ is, is here at least every other year or so. Directly interfacing with those people is just an incredible boon to your career, especially early in your career. Getting to pick people's brains on things, um, just hanging out, talking with people, you can't put a price on that. And you don't get those online. All right, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Marco Slomp. I'm a research engineer with uh, Adobe Research, and I belong to the research engineering design team, uh, RED, at Adobe. And uh, a lot of what I do is transfer research over to products. Uh, and often, performance is something to consider, uh, because a lot of tech transfers, they might fail because performance wasn't considered. So uh, it's, a, it's a pretty important topic and something that is very dear to me. And something that I've been doing frequently uh, throughout my career, even in other places that I've worked. So to begin here, uh, who here frequently profile your code? Okay, that's about 50% of the, the folks here. Uh, who, for those that profile, who here is familiar with instrumentation-based profiling? Okay, pretty much everybody. Yeah, so if you're not familiar, if you don't do profiling very often because you know who has time for that, right? Um, and if you are familiar with instrumentation-based profiling, uh, a final question that I have is, for those that are familiar and use instrumentation profiling, or even just sampling-based, traditional sampling-based profiling, who here is completely satisfied with the profiler they have and really there's no uh, extra features they want? Okay, great. Because if that's the case, maybe your problems are over, right? I am here to introduce you, Tracy. <laughs> which is a revolutionary profiler, uh, at least it is in my opinion. Um, let's see, what did I write about it? You know, it's, it allows real-time workflow, so as your program is running, you can actually go interact with the profiler. It's, it, it, it's capable of pushing like millions of events per second. It can give you very precise measurements down to nanosecond levels or tens of nanoseconds, uh, uh, if that's the case. There is very, very little overhead. It's cross-platform, it works on a bunch of platforms. I think even WebAssembly is on the, on the pipeline. Uh, it has this hybrid profiling capabilities, meaning that you can mix sampling and instrumentation-based profiling, even GPU profiling alongside with CPU profiling, which is a killer feature for me at least. I do a lot of GPU-related stuff, so it's really, really important to have that feature. It can help you with the tracing, which again, if you don't understand sampling instrumentation tracing, I'm, I have a slide that I'm gonna explain that. And another very important feature here, it's very hassle-free to integrate. There are several ways you can do it and it's pretty easy to do, uh, and it's free and open source, so really there is no excuse for you to go there and try. All right, so first things first, I'm not the creator of Tracy, right? That goes uh, to, I, I think his name is Bartosz Taldul. I hope I pronunciated his name properly. He's the creator and maintaining of, a maintainer of Tracy, so thank you, Bartosz, for sharing Tracy uh, with the world. And another person that I wanna thank here is David Farrell uh, at Adobe. He works on Modeler, which is a a sculpting, a 3D sculpting uh, application that we have on the Substancy 3D modeler. And he's the person that introduced Trace to me in a time that I really needed something like Tracy to be able to move forward with important tech transfer. And if it wasn't for Tracy at that then, which I was aware of, I was just not aware if it would be good fit, but if it wasn't for him like, hey, look at this, and was like, okay, I know what I have to do now. <laughs> so thank you, David, for really uh, helping with that. Right, so, Disclaimer, I'm not gonna be comparing Tracy with several profiling tools. Some of you are probably familiar with some of those tools there. This is not about this talk. You'll be the judge. If you're familiar with one of those tools and you see Tracy now, you'll be the judge and you'll tell me which one you prefer. All right, let's begin with some obligatory quotes. I believe you're all familiar with this quote. Premature optimization is the root of all evil. Uh, are you familiar with the rest of the quote? Because that's where the important thing is, right? And uh, I recommend you go and actually read the paper. It's an excellent paper. Uh, but the, basically, the, the thing here is not about premature optimization. It's that we tend to waste a lot of time worrying about performance in places that really don't matter. So the, 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 the real thing here, the mindset is like, there is that critical that he says 3% that we should really focus on. There is a talk at CPPCon and another conference by Mathieu Hopet. I hope I pronounced his name correctly. And 
He says the same, you know, the problem is that programmers spend a lot of time worrying about things that really don't matter. Even more fitting, on this conference, three days ago, during the keynote, the opening keynote of the conference, Bjarne on stage mentioned that, you know, C++ programmers, they tend to bicker a lot about efficiency, but they generally don't know how to measure. So hopefully I can help you change that a little bit. So uh, people that were not familiar with all those words that I mentioned in the beginning, there is tracing, which usually means you are going through programs or uh, stacks and libraries and systems. You want to see what's going on, right? What, what's calling what? What kind of data is flowing? What are the arguments? What are error messages and things flowing on? Usually you're not worried about performance here, but it can help you detect performance problems. But usually it's more a debugging aid. Then you have sampling, which a lot of profilers do, which is basically you don't need to do anything on a program. You just let it run, and then the operating system will go and interrupt your program at specific intervals, collect call stacks, and do some magic, and then boom, here are potential problems for you. The problem is sampling tends to aggregate things together. So if you are familiar with signal processing, you have that idea of like time domain and frequency domain. You basically lose the time domain and you just get the frequency domain, which is very helpful, it's very insightful, but you, you're missing on a, a large thing. Then there is instrumentation where you go yourself and actively annotate your code on portions that you want to measure. Instrumentation can also happen automatically, but that usually adds a lot of overhead because the tool instrumenting your code doesn't know what's important. So it just goes instrumenting everything, right? And if you have tiny little routines, the overhead of instrumenting usually can be higher than the overhead of actually running that little thing that it's trying to instrument. So manual instrumentation is usually the wise choice. Then you have the analysis part. Do you have to pre-record? Can you interact with the application while you're looking at the profiling results? The, how does it show you? Is it like a giant log file that you have to sift through? Is it like a command line thing that you have to know esoteric commands? Maybe there's a GUI if you're lucky. And the important thing here, and that really defines Tracy, is that it's interactive, it's responsive, and it's very visual. And for me, this defines the experience. All these three things, actually four things, tracing, sampling, instrumentation, analysis, the cool thing is, Tracy can do it all for you, right? So uh, my talk is going to be quite experimental. I have a lot to cover. I might not be able to cover everything, but let's see what I can do. So this is what a Tracy session looks like, and you might be entering like a analysis paralysis mode, so let me try to help you. There is different sessions, and the profiler is divided. You can see a CPU. You know what? Why don't we? try to demonstrate that with a little bit of, a, having a little bit of fun. Turns out that making a talk about a profiler is a very good way to ask permission for a manager to, you know, install and compile Quake 2 from source just for, you know, research purpose, purposes, of course. <laughs> so this is what I'm gonna do. So what I have here is a Tracy profiler tool that we know that you saw there. It's gonna look like that in a second. And I'm gonna hit this connect button. Now the profiler is waiting for an application to start sending telemetry, if you will, information to the profiler. And what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna launch Quake 2. Right, hope you can see, Quake is running. If you look at the background, the profiler is going bananas. There is a lot of stuff going on there, uh, but we're gonna go and have a look at that, and I could just go to the profiler and interact with the profiler as, the, the, as the, the game is running. Let me move here to the end. And you can see it keeps pushing events there like there is no tomorrow. But I think that's enough. Okay, maybe we can start a new game here just to make the tracing more interesting there. And uh, I'm gonna spare you of me playing Quake here on stage. Uh, I used to play Quake very well, Quake 2 very well in the past, but I, it was a long, long time ago. Right, so uh, that's a perfect opportunity for us to at least uh, get our bearings straight here and see what's going on here. So the first thing I wanna mention to you, Trace is a, as advertisement, as advertises a frame profiler, so if your application can be divided as frames, it has some very good functionality for that. Like say it's a video game or an interactive application. But for me, actually the framing part is actually not that interesting. Uh, it, it can be very interesting, but it's, it's everything else. At the top here, you see those are frames in frame informations. If you see in green, means you are below the 60 FPS target, and I don't think you can change that. I think that's fixed. Everything is yellow is a little bit above that. 
And if you see something red, it's something that is really above. And I can click here, and the provider jumps to that particular frame, which, by the way, you have to annotate. We're going to see how that's done later. And it tells me, OK, uh, this frame here, and we can see here it took like 38 milliseconds here, right? So something happened there, and then maybe we have to go and investigate that. So the other thing here, you have the main thread executing, and you have this like stack of things. Every one of those little rectangles is like a zone. Think of like a call stack. Everything is the top is like the, the root, and then you keep calling things and, and drilling down. So for example, I have Q common frame, has a CL frame, which is a client frame. Quake 2 is like a client server architecture. Then uh, SCR update screen uh, that calls render view, and then there is some copy frame and some call to SDL and, and so on. So right, so it's like a call stack. Um, you will see how to annotate your code to get this visualization later. Then you also get CPU usage here. I think this is given to you at intervals of, yeah, 100 milliseconds or so. This is for free. Trace give you this for, use for free. Uh, you can collapse if you don't care about that. There is another thread here, 489, blah, blah, blah. You, you can name threads. We'll see how to do that as well. But I can tell you that this thread here is audio. So if we really zoom in, you can see that we are like, microsecond level zooming here. There was a little SDL audio call back there, and there was a call to some mem copy there to copy the audio buffers. Then there is this memory usage. Again, Tracy can help you to track memory allocations. We'll see how to do that. And then there was a bunch of other plots that I added because I was trying to understand a few things about the Quake 2 engine. Uh, and again, you can collapse them and all that. Now. Another interesting thing is this. Uh, so if you click on statistics here, it will show you, okay, from all those zones, what, how many times it was called? What's the mean time per call, which is the last column here, MTPC? Uh, it can show your location. And if I hover over, it shows me like a little snapshot of where in the source code that is. If I right click, it actually brings a view of the source code there so I can kind of better situate myself. Now. The cool thing is like, as it is showing here, it's very similar to what you would have on a sampling-based profiling because it's an aggregate, right? There's like a 1,300 calls to SDR render percent. Uh, but the cool thing is that I can just go here, I can right click, and I can limit the statistics to a specific range. So let's say I'm only interested in this range here. So now it's giving me an aggregate only on that range. It's computing those things in real time. Again, back to the signal processing thing, it's kind of like wavelets, right? It mixes time domain with frequency domain, and this is very, very powerful for uh, identifying anomalies in your code. Um, other things you can do, if I click on a zone here, it will show me a histogram of that particular uh, zone. Uh, so we can see the mean time here, the median, the mode, and the sigma. By the way, I'm sorry if the font is a little too small. Maybe that's a very good way to ask people to move forward if it's difficult to read. I have some tricks I can play, you know, I can try to zoom in here, but it, there's, oh, and actually, you know what, Tracy also has a little bit of a zoom here, but I really need the real estate here to present, so I would like to stay at 100%. Um, you know, and then you can group things, so this SDL, okay, who called that? Okay, it looks like only the main thread calls, and then I can see on that range all the instances where it was called, I can sort them, I can group them by different ways. Again, we don't have time to go through every single thing that Tracy does. Even, I don't know, every now and then I go there and, oh, you can do that in Tracy. That's really cool. It's exactly what I was looking for. So I encourage you to go and explore uh, Tracy as, uh, uh, after the talk if this is something that you like. There's a few more information here that you can get on Tracy. You can click on info. It gives you some statistics about the trace. In particular, it interests this queue delay and timer resolution. This is for machine you're running, what's the cost of taking a measurement? In an M1 here, which is an ARM chip, it's actually pretty high, 41 nanoseconds. It's actually pretty high. Some Intel chips, uh, it's like four nanoseconds. So you can really do very precise measurements on, on those uh, architectures. And I have some safe traces here that we can explore later. Again, we don't have time to go through everything uh, that is here. So what I'm gonna do here, I'm, you know what? Let's click here, let's save this trace just in case something goes really bad with the presentation because it is very experimental what I'm doing here. Uh, just in case I need to know it. 
nice, it compresses for you, and then we can basically safely discard this. Then what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna briefly go back to my presentation. So what you saw that, I opened that tool, which was the profiler, that's called the server, right? That is the server. Quake was the client, that's the application that you're instrumenting. And they communicate via socket. In this case, it's just a loopback, you know, it's on the same machine. But you can do via network, so someone can be running the application and you can be on the other side of the office and like looking at the, and helping understand what's going on. To integrate, it's very easy. So the responsible way is that you have to include the Tracy header whenever you wanna use the instrumentation directives that Tracy offers you. You need to compile this file tracyclient.cpp alongside your application. It doesn't matter how you do it. Uh, it has to be in your application embedded there, compiled alongside of your application and linked together. And obviously you have to do a tracy enable define which actually triggers, because if you don't, all the instrumentation that you do becomes a no-op. It just goes away, right? So you can instrument and then disable trace and then there's no overhead, but you need that a toggle there to enable it. So this is the responsible way. Then there is the not so responsible way, uh, which is actually, I like it, because again, I work on a lot of projects and sometimes I have to go there quickly drop Tracy, do an experiment, and get away without anyone noticing. And that is like, you just include the client somewhere in the source tree, and you're good to go. So that's what I really like. You can do both, right? So if you are serious about Tracy, yeah, think about how to properly integrate. If you just wanna do it like just to have fun or because you have something specific you wanna um, check, uh, you can just uh, uh, do it quickly. Now for the profiler that you saw that, you can download a pre-compiled binary for Windows, or you have to build it yourself on Linux and Mac. But that's actually pretty easy. I'm gonna show you how to do. So one caveat about Tracy across shared libraries, if you just go willy-nilly including Tracy client on every single one of your shared libraries that you link together and you run, you're gonna run into the, what I call the Tracy multiverse. Uh, you're gonna see multiple streams of Tracy, you click one of them, it's just one view of one of those libraries. Right, so ideally you need to have a Tracy library that all libraries share, and then you can get the proper way. If you're on Windows, then you have to do the Tracy exports and Tracy imports because there is the DLL spec. You know, simple visibility stuff, so basic stuff. I think uh, you can go uh, read how to do that. This is how you build a profiler. It's very simple. On Windows, there is already a batch file which just installed the VCPKG, VCPKG dependencies locally. For, locally, like you don't even need to install in your global VCPKG. It's locally there. And then you just open the Visual Studio solution that comes with Tracy and boom, you're good to go. On uh, Linux, it's, Linux is kind of weird because uh, the package names vary depending on distros and all that. But generally, the instructions are there and the Tracy manual is very good at, at telling what to do. And on Mac, you can use Brew and uh, makes things a little easier. So I had to build it from source here. If we have time in the end, I can even clean and build again. I mean, it's not exciting at all. It's just, it's pretty boring, but if someone wants to see, I can do that. All right, so all good so far? Right, so the fundamental thing you need to understand to use trace instrumentation is the concept of a zone scope. But that's pretty easy. If you know the RAII paradigm on C++, that's all that is. Anything between curly braces, that's a zone. Right, and so here's an example. I have a function, I have two conditionals here, there, like one condition and one freestanding block there. Those are three zones. You have an encompassing big one and two smaller zones therein. And the bread and butter of Tracy is this thing called zone scope. If you use zone scope, you can only have one per zone if you have multiple ones. We don't have time to go through Tracy internals, but that zone scope is a macro that kind of declares an object behind your back and if you have multiple ones, the name of the variable will clash and will get an error. So you only have one per scope. And it will infer the name of the zone based on the function it's contained within. So you can see that even the things inside the conditional and the things inside the, the, the freestanding block here, uh, come on, uh, they all call foo, right? Because it's getting the name from the function, right? Um, and Trace will also give an automatic color. Even if you have multiple threads, every thread is kind of it's gonna have its own color automatically. So I can keep going on and showing you the slides, but because Trace is so cool and you can look at source, oh my God, come on. Uh, you can lose your source code. I actually wrote a little program that exemplifies all those slides that I'm gonna show you. 
And I think we can um, go and have a look at that. So where did I put that? Let's select the traces. There it is. Well, let's go back to the beginning here. So I believe we are in slide 22, yeah. So we're good to go, we are syn synchronized here. So this is the example here that I was talking about. The cool thing is that we can just click here, we can click source. That's the little example of the source code that I was showing to you right there, just with a few stuff there. So another thing you can do with tracing is this idea of, let me show the source, I can actually give a name to a zone. I don't need to get a name from the enclosing function. I can just give it whatever name I want. And then you add this little suffix n here, maybe a little easier to see, and then I can just give whatever name I want. Um, and if you do that, now if I look here, you can see that I have, there's no spoon, so we are in the matrix. And then there's a cleanup going on there. Another thing you can do is, let's look at the source here. I can give colors. I can give a hexadecimal RGB, a RGB triplet there for a color. That's like that lime green there. Um, yes, tomato is a color, like according to Trace. It uses the X11 palette for color, so tomato is a color. So, you know, you can change the color. And let me go back to the slides because, okay, we saw about the, giving the name. I didn't mention, but that string you give has to be a persistent string. Uh, it cannot be something allocated on the stack. It has to persist throughout the execution of your program. Again, we don't have time to go through trace internals. Just follow the rules. There is an explanation there. You can go read in the manual. Color, again, X11 colors. And I'm not even joking. Like, if you understand this, you can go very far with Tracy with just that. Really, really far with just that. But we have time, so let's try to move on. So another thing that I wanna show you here is this idea of programmatically changing things. Um, so what I did here, like, see that I'm not using a scope inside the if condition there. I'm just calling zone name. That's basically changing the name of the zone. So it used to be called foo if I, if I didn't, if I just call it like zone scoped. It would be called foo, but I can programmatically change the name based on where I am there. And I can also programmatically change the color. So if there is an error, instead of just using the default color that Tracy gave me, I can make, I can show you something more striking that, hey, something went wrong there. So you can, you can do things like that. The problem is, if I look at, and let me just restrict the statistics here, um, you can see that it, that zone here, and if I click it, it will even highlight for me, it's still called foo in the statistics. So I've just cheated the timeline. On the timeline, I changed the name. But as far as the statistics go, it's still getting that old name. So my recommendation is just avoid using zone name because you're just going to confuse the living hell of whoever is like using your trace. Uh, so it, it has its uses, but it's, I think it's very situational. Um, and then we can just go to right here. Right, uh, moving on. Uh, this is a fun little example here. How is your Pokemon lore going? Okay, there's gonna be a trivia later. Uh, so what I did here is, um, again, because we work with scopes, uh, I can put the scope inside a for loop, so every element will have a partition there under the, the place, right? And you can measure things there. Not only I can do that, uh, but I can also assign a value to, to that place. So if I go back here and I hover over Pokemon, do you see like the number there, 25, 39, 52? Usually when you go over a zone, for example, earlier here, there is nothing there. But because I annotate it, now I have this number. So uh, just advance the slides a little bit here. Talked about the name. So trivia, anyone knows which Pokemon has ID 39? How about now? Oh, I see some people are. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna show the big review later if you're not familiar with. Um, 
Right, so let's look at this example here now. Let's go to the source here. What I did here was, uh, why stop at one value if you can actually have more values here? So you can see I have like ID, HP, defense, speed, and all that. And now if I hover over the zone, now I have all that information laid down there. So you know that whichever Pokemon has ID 39 has 115 HP, 20 defense, and 20 speed. So maybe, maybe, maybe someone now will know which Pokemon that is. Um, another thing we can do is we can add, oops, why didn't it show me the source code for this one? We can add text to, the, to that zone there. So now it's going to be showing um, uh, not only the value, but a text as well. And I think I want to demonstrate here because I don't want to destroy the surprise. So this was only with the values. This is if you have text and values, you can mix them together. They will be showing on that order. And now for the grand rate review, it, it's the Jigglypuff, right? So, um, all right. Um, yeah, I even plotted the number, the size of the Pokedex here. Forgot about it. What else do we have here? Um, Oh yeah, this is just showing a shortcut. It's not important, really. Uh, let's move on. Um, so another thing that I want to show you here. So so far we could only have one zone per scope, right? That was the, the basic rule that we had there. You can actually have multiple zones so long as you actually give them a name. And I know it's confused because a name is that string, but in this case it's like if you can name the variable that that macro instantiate the object, then you can have multiple ones. It's just that it's not gonna do what you expect. You would expect like to partition, but it's actually gonna do this like stacking behavior here. So that might not be what you want. But the real cool thing here is that it offers this like active argument. This last argument is active. So now I can programmatically choose if I wanna show a zone or not. And that can be, for example, a const expert Boolean that uh, uh, you can, for example, you are profiling a subsystem and you don't care about the file system for what you're doing. And maybe whoever profiled the file system portion on your application went crazy and there's too many events, you don't care about that, you can just disable that and profile the rest, right? So, and if you use a const expert, it's even possible the compiler can look at the code and say, hey, this, is this all zone here that you're passing is going to become a no op. And it can elide and put that away. So that's a cool thing you can do. Um, I do have, there are some more caveats there, um, which we can um, perhaps have a look here. Um, no, I want this one. You know, you can, you also have a specific one called zone text. We had zone text, zone value. There is a V version V is for the variable. So, so long as you pass that variable here, you can change those attributes that I showed you to that specific zone. There's a caveat that, for example, right here, after I have all these zones, uh, I try to change the value of the simulation zone, which was like right here. And if I do that, it actually is not gonna do what you think it, it will do, because if I look at the simulation zone, there is no value there. The value is actually on the last zone that you put. So this can be confusing. So again, there are specific rules that Tracy follows about zone annotation. It's on the manual, you can go and read it. Right, there's a cheat sheet about zoning. So remember that I mentioned that if you change the name of a zone, it would just, it would change the name, but then when you look at the statistics, uh, it's just gonna be using whatever original name the zone had, right? Oh, there's a way to modify that. That's called a transient zone. If we use a transient zone, now we are no longer constraint about uh, persistent strings. We can actually have strings allocated on the stack, uh, and we can pass that, and it will actually reflect on the statistics. Obviously, there is more cost associated with that, because it's not just, Trace is not just like holding a pointer and passing along to the profiler, it's actually copying the string and passing along every single time that loop executes, so it is something to be in mind. But sometimes it's the right thing to do. Some more things in the manual that you can read about it. 
And the last one that I want to show, and I think this one is best shown if we look back at the quake trace, is uh, this ability of capturing stacks. So that suffix that you have that S gives you access to the call stack of that zone. And the number you pass in parentheses is the depth, the call stack. So if I do that, I go, I click on the frame, I'm going to have now not only the source button that I had before, but also this call stack button there available. And if I click that, boom, I have all the call stack up to that call site. Uh, and this can be extremely useful. And this also allows some other tricks, which maybe I'll have time to show later. So maybe we can open the Quake example. And you know what? I'm going to open a new instance of Trace in here. Keep both of them open at the same time here. Um, where did I save that? Oh, just zip call. Yeah, just zip call. So I, if I recall correctly, I, I put a call stack on the render frame. No, scan edges. Scan edges has one. So uh, you know, these ones here, if you go to the source, it's just a regular scope. But the scan edges that I actually instrumented with um, scoped S. And now if I click on the call stack, there you have it. And even shows me the modules, so which shared library is coming from. And I have the source code here readily available that I can kind of explore. And if I right click, uh, for some reason, it's OK. Now there it is, right? So it's showing me a little bit about uh, where and information was simple. It's very helpful. There is a limitation on the stack depth. It's around 60. It's a little more than that. Um, it's 60 is plenty, but you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. Uh, so there is a cost to capturing call stacks. It should be obvious, you know. So you don't go like putting all your zones with call stacks. Uh, do it, use it wisely. Uh, it depends on the platform. It depends on how deep the stack is. And here's a cheat sheet of everything that I, sh I mentioned so far, right? So uh, if you really want the lowest possible overhead, you stick to those two at the top. But uh, there are situations where you might want to use the other ones. Right. The other very, very transformative thing, at least for me with Tracy, is the idea of logging messages. And the reason I mentioned just an interlude here, there is the L version of Trace message that usually Trace message you have to to pass a runtime string, which means you have to pass a string and a size. If it's a known persistent string that is static, you, there's a shortcut. You can just send that static string. It's, just, it's the only uh, annotation in Tracy that has the L. Uh, and if you do that, now you have access to these message logs. And this is really cool for several reasons. But for me, it's basically a console replacement. Console is obsolete for me, because if I use this, now I have information about the time where that message happens, which thread. I can give it a color. I can browse the log. I can type something there and actually filter the log. I can choose just which threads I want to see messages from. And I don't need to worry about thread synchronization like you would do when you log to a file or a console, right? It's really, really powerful concept. And I have an example here. Uh, let's go back to our, I'm going to do this. I'm just going to minimize here. I have an example here with um, a very, very advanced uh, word generator that I created here. So I, what I did here, let me explain to you. I spawned four threads. This is what I'm doing, spawning four, four threads. Uh, and uh, every thread is like a parrot, so they just keep saying things. So the thread, the parrot thread, is basically it's very, uses a very sophisticated AI algorithm for generating sentences, which is called gibberish, which just gets some random words from a corpus of a thousand words that I have and then spills out. So now what I can do is just I can go and I click on message here, and there you have it. I have like which thread is uh, producing a message, the timeline. I can click on a message, so let me actually zoom down. So let's say I'm interested on this. A message here. Do you see that little red thing bouncing around like on the second pair? It's hard to see. But that's that message. I can even click there. Tracy tries to, uh, you know, give me some visual, better visual clues of what, where, what that message is happening. Uh, I can search for a specific word. So maybe, did any parrot say the word cat? Looks like one did, and it's like, 
uh, it's a completely nonsense sentence, but it's, it's there, I can say, hey, I only care about what uh, parrot three is saying. So now I have all the methods that parrot, parrot three say. Um, there's a very philosophical, there, there are some very philosophical sentences here that I found like even with this algorithm, like um, it makes you wonder. Um, anyway, <laughs> I digress. So yeah, I, 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 for me, this is pretty cool. I, I really like this idea of like uh, having a better way to go through and sweep through log messages. Uh, right, you can plot values. Remember you saw those plots and you can do simple plots which just interpolate amongst the samples. Um, and you can actually configure a plot before in advance. You just need to do that once and then you can make them look more like a staircase. You can remove the shading, uh, can give them a different color and all that. And you can have multiple plots. So what I did here, I have an example here with a plot. Let me see where that is. You should be right here, it's right here. It's just, it's a lot of stuff. So this is just a sync filter that I was evaluating at specific intervals there in the source code. You can see here what I did. Um, it's really nothing special. Oops, not statistics, I wanna see the source. It's just evaluating this sync filter here. I give a name, then the, the plot has a name here as well called filter kernel. Even gives you some statistics about the samples in that plot. Um, here's the function if you're curious. Then I also did another one here, which is the stair. So you know, let me collapse. Unfortunately, I'm doing a disservice to Tracy because it works much better on Win. Oh, what happened? Oh, we're back. Uh, it works much better on Windows because there are some bugs on IAM GUI and all that on macOS. So you see, I don't have a vertical scroll bar on the right side, but if you go on Windows or Linux, it's there, right? So fortunately, there was a few quirks that, uh, you know, prevent me to show cool stuff. But here's a start step. Like it's basically a random walk that I implemented on, a, on, a, on the plot here. It's just doing, a, just start with a value and then you go moving at different steps and plotting that. Nothing really fancy, just for demonstration purposes. Right. Uh, memory allocation is a really good one. Uh, this, I've got, again, I have to show this in the context of uh, Quake, but basically if you annotate your memories with trace alloc and trace C3, and there is versions that can even capture the call stack for you, very powerful, uh, I can then select a range of my profile and say, okay, tell me which allocations are still active here. So it's a good way to detect leaks. You, at the end of your application, hopefully this list here of allocations is empty. If it's not, well, you didn't deallocate, or at least you didn't tell Tracy that you deallocated that. So you can go back and hunt them down. Uh, maybe you can demonstrate that on, on, on Quake. Um, okay, so uh, memory. Let me zoom out here. Active allocations. So this is looking at the entire program execution. So as you can see, there's a lot of leaks actually, you know, like. Uh, it's just that, you know, when you're gonna exit the application, they just don't bother deallocating what's there. It's fine, you know, that it can be done. But uh, let's say I'm looking for a specific range, like, I'm oh, sorry, you can limit to memory range. And now I can move around. And now it's showing me just allocation, oops. It's gonna be showing me just allocations, like in that specific range that are there. Um, and you can go and click on them and you, it, it can take you exactly to where the allocation happened. So it looks like that one that I clicked happened, oops, I'm zooming in, I wanna zoom out, happened somewhere around here. You can instrument locks, which can tell you threads that are holding the lock, threads that are waiting for the lock. Again, this is very nice. The problem is you actually have to it's a little intrusive because you have to actually modify the declaration of the lock. I have a trick for that that I, if I have time, I will show to you. And then you also have to kind of annotate the lock guard, although with template deduction based on constructors, you can get away with that. And there's a version for shared locks as well for reader, writer, mutexes. So 
Uh, I do have an example here um, for that. That's, uh, I believe, this slide here. I just have to remember. Yeah, those are the ones. So I, again, I, I made a, it's just a simple producer-consumer queue, very, very um, simple one that I have in source here. It's, again, it's in spawning pair of threads, two pairs of producer-consumer threads. And this is a multiple producer, multi-consumer queue that I protected with a lock. So when you are consuming, um, you call the consume method on a message queue. When you are producing, you call the produce. And the way they work is that during the produce, you get a lock. During the consume, you get a lock. And here's an example where, you know, ideally, you have to decorate the scoped lock with that lockable base thing. But because there's that template argument deduction in constructors, you can actually get away with that. The thing you cannot get away with is that you have to change the declaration of mutex to do this trace lockable thing now, which is a little intrusive in my opinion. But hey, you get this nice little thing, which I can now show you, where if I zoom in, I have those threads, and then I can click, OK, right here, Thread producer one is blocked by another thread producer zero. So I can see that, you know, this thread is now has the lock and it's blocking the three other threads um, here, right? So it, it can be very informative to see what's going on when you have contention and all that. So I, I, I have 20 minutes left here. So I, what I'm gonna do here, like, I, it's like, again, I have a lot of material here that I can go through. I, I, I would like to let the audience decide where they wanna go. I can continue and just talk about a lot of tips and tricks that I can give to you. We can look a little bit about GPU instrumentation. I, I pre card unfortunately, there is no GPU instrumentation support on Apple at the moment, but I pre-capture one on my Windows machine that I can show to you. Again, using Quake, very, very convenient. We can look at the trace sampling mode because so far I only showed you the instrumentation mode, but there is a very powerful sampling mode as well that you can use. We can look at study cases or you can just have questions, ask me to do a few things here. If it's simple, we can try to do it on stage. I don't know, uh, it looks like someone has a question. So the question is, is it possible to change what is being captured, capture all the processes running? I don't know, I'm not sure if I understand your uh, question. My, my wish is a, for, uh, same execution, one in, in debug mode will capture everything, and one in production capture almost nothing, just yes. Um, first of all, I, technically you shouldn't profile the application in debug mode, because debug mode will slow things down already because there's no optimization, so that's one thing. But yes, you can use those active flags that I showed to you to kind of silence instrumentation. Now, if you use a runtime Boolean for active zones, there is a runtime check, but it's usually pretty cheap and very easy for the processor to predict the branch. If you use a const expert, it's possible that it's going a light away, but then you have to recompile the program. So you can do that. There is a runtime check which is called Tracy is connected. And then if trace is connected, you can do expensive stuff. So if you want to capture cost tax, you can just run your program normally. And then, okay, now that I have a profiler actually connected, now I, can, I actually want to keep these expensive things that I have here. So to answer a question, yes, you can do, but maybe not exactly what you're hoping for, but it, it is possible with those active tricks and all that. Okay, so let's, I, I saw you over there first. Yes, yes. So the question is, do you need the profiler GUI? Can you just run and capture those events to look at that later? Yes, there is another uh, application that ships with Tracy in the source tree. It's called Capture. That's exactly that. It's basically a headless profiler that just gets the events and stores it to disk for you. So, so by default, if Tracy is connected in source, still pushes most of the data out to IUDP, hoping that uh, no, it doesn't, that's the, it's a very good question. So the question is, so if Tracy just keeps pushing things over the UDP hoping that something gets connected, actually, no, what happens like Tracy never, I have a slide about that in the end, Tracy never forgets. It can be very memory hungry, hungry. If you're not connected to the application, it's gonna keep piling events in your RAM like crazy until you actually connect and then it flushes, right? So this can be dangerous. Another, pro, another thing related to that is, if you're running the profiler on the same machine as you're running the application, 
Sure, you are offloading the memory from Tracy from the events to the profiler, but it's the same machine, so your the RAM is the same. So it's recommended if you have like some something very very deep that you want to profile, very complicated, very beefy, that you run the profiler on a different machine, and that's kind of the cool thing about Tracy. Uh, back there. Yeah. So uh, you're talking about cases. What about earlier? You were showing tracing a message with uh, uh, the text, but in a situation where you have an application that sends messages through queues, and you have either several threads or even several other processes. Can you trace each specific message through the queues and see when they arrive and are processed at each point? Uh, so the question is, uh, do you have, how much control do you have over tracking messages uh, across threads and applications, right? Well, the way Tracy works, uh, it, it, again, you don't have any control. That's the answer, no, you don't have control. The way Tracy works is just that, Every time you call a Tracy message, it's gonna, there is like a multi-producer, multi-consumer, a very fast one. It's just gonna post an event to the queue. Then there is a background thread that is trying to push those events to the server. But it has a timestamp. It knows like when your application called a Tracy message, that was the timestamp. And that is going to be shown and preserved on the server. But uh, it, Tracy doesn't work across processes, just across threads of the same process. So uh, hopefully that, Answers part of your question. We have a gentleman there. How did you name the different threads? Like yes, I, I, I do have, um, you know what? I, okay. It's a cool thing I can actually show you here. <laughs> um, the, the way you name is very simple. So there is a routine on Tracy. Usually Trace tries to get the, on Windows it will try to get the thread name by itself, which is really cool. On, and I think on Linux as well, not on Mac OS. But you can just tell Tracy what you want to, call, want to call a thread. So in your thread, so when I instantiate every one of my parrots, I gave them an ID, and then here, Tracy, set thread name, parrot ID. Now it's gonna be show as parrot 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Question there? Yeah, I can talk about simply mode if that's where the audience wanna, wanna go. Any objections? Oh, I see a lot of hands. Yeah. Are, are hands questions or objections? Objections. objections. <laughs> okay, what should I do? <laughs> okay, GPU instrumentation is quick. So let, let's do that. Let's do GPU instrumentation again. And then it's, it's brief, I can, in five minutes I can show everything. Three minutes I can show everything and then we can look at simply and maybe we wrap up. And maybe I can just blaze through a, a, a few example cases that I have. So let me open a new tracing instance here. So this is uh, OpenGL with Tracy. And as you can see, right now, right at the top here, not only you have the CPU threads, but I have an OpenGL queue. So this is actually instrumenting OpenGL. And I can do go and instrument the thing. I don't know if I have access to the code. Unfortunately, it doesn't, I don't have access to the code, but I can show you later. There is a special instrumentation directives for GPU for every type of backend, Directory 11, Directory 12, OpenGL, Vulkan, you know, you, you have to use them. Uh, but then I can zoom in and I, I can see what's going on. So in this case of uh, Quake, you know, you can see that most of the, the time you will spend on swap buffers because again, it's an old game, right? But uh, uh, there's a lot of like transferring data here. There is probably some draw call somewhere here if I explore. Now, the cool thing here is that when I hover over a, um, a, a, a GPU session, you can see that there is like delay to execution down there. Delay to execution is like from the CPU timeline so the GPU executing this command, this was the latency. So there is a calibration step where Tracy tries to calibrate the CPU and GPU clocks and show you that. And here it's difficult to see because, um, no, here, it's a perfect one. Do you see that like when I hover over this GL buffer and draw, there is that little vertical line that highlights? That is telling me that this GPU command, the command that actually triggered that was issued somewhere on that Place there. So if I zoom in here, I don't have it instrumented here, uh, but somewhere there is where the GL buffer 
uh, whatever the command was there, I don't remember, buffer and draw. It's probably like some gel buffer data or gel draw something. So you can do that. Is that, is that good, GPU? Um, I mean, okay, so uh, 10 minutes. Uh, sampling, 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 sampling. Uh, so sampling, before we go sampling, uh, because sampling, I, I don't have, we, we can actually uh, have some fun with the sampling mode. Um, sampling is interesting because in order to do sampling, all you need is to include the Tracy client in your program. You don't need to do any instrumentation. You just put this, compile this with your code. Then you run your application in admin, with admin privileges because that's what most operating system requires so that it will produce sampling events for you, actually interrupt your process and check the call stack. You can actually do both. You can mix inst instrumentation and sampling together, right? So that's another real cool thing about um, uh, Tracy. And I did instrument something here. Uh, just real quick, we have a few minutes. How many of you are familiar with the Tupper self-referential formula? Okay, this is a cool party trick, right? Like, generative AI is all the rage nowadays, right? This is like old school generative AI, right? And the way it works, look at this formula and think about this grid where you have X and Y's, right? I can plug X and Y's there, and I can get this image, which looks familiar, right? That's why it's called a self-referential formula. Okay, there's a caveat, right? It's actually, the Y is actually gonna be like a number K, and then uh, you go like from zero, K plus zero, one, two, three, 17, right? And this K is a very, high, very, very huge number. If you actually look at how Tupper's formula works, it's actually very, very simple. And uh, once you know how the magic is done, it kind of, yeah, it's, it's not that interesting. But it's still a very cool party trick when people are not aware of. And it can generate any image, any image, right? So I actually have a fun little thing here we can do real quick here. Um, right, so I wrote a program and um, again, uh, we can decode, and I, so let me show you the file. That's the number, and the bottom is the resolution, right? And then I, I wrote a program where you can decode that tuper. That, that's what it is. I have other ones here. I have this one. It's pretty cool. Maybe another one, right? Um, and you can have arbitrary sizes. But it, so I have a very large one here, and that's gonna take a while. It's a 60 uh, something by 64 tall image, and it, it's a ginormous number. So I'm even gonna interrupt here, and we can look at that file. That's a number, it's, it's I don't know how many digits there. Uh, but the thing is, you can actually optimize that formula, because that is a very general formula. But once you know, okay, the, the height is a power of two, and you go back to the form, it actually, it's essentially picking the right bit from that large number. Like, that, that's really what it is on the top form. And I kind of optimized, sorry, I, I optimized that, and maybe we can open here the, I can enable the optimization. And I swear, I'm getting to the sampling part portion of that. It's just that, uh, the, the, the sampling that I capture is based on this application, so I just want to make sure that people have the context. And uh, so what I did, I just enabled the optimization. So if this is a power of two, you know, if the IH is a power of two, we can actually run in fast mode. Uh, it's building here, it shouldn't take too long. And now if I try to run my Tupper program again, remember it was pretty slow, it was like really, now it's basically instantaneous, right? with those optimizations. So the way, the way I did to optimize this was I decided, okay, let me have a sampling profiling example. And what I did, I captured the before. Sampling can be very, very intensive. It's like a large application like Photoshop, oh, good luck doing sampling-based profiler, especially on a machine that has many cores, right? So this was captured on my workstation. It has 32 cores, 64 logical cores, um, and it would generate a lot of data. So, uh, so just to give it, just, it can tell you exactly what's going on. So for example, I see that my main thread was executing on CPU one. Well, that's, that's an interesting thing here. I was executing, sorry, CPU two, and then it's, the operating system rescheduled to CPU, was executing on CPU two, then it rescheduled to CPU four and all that. And there's a bunch of stuff you can see just on the CPU timeline. 
But I will collapse this because I want to show the important things here. And like right now, if you instrument your code alongside sampling, it will show instrumentation by default. But there is this little ghost here now that wasn't there before. If I click here, now I'm switching to just the sampling mode. So this is what, if you don't have instrumentation, that's what it will show you. If you have instrumentation and sampling together, it will prefer to show you instrumentation first and then sampling. And then to answer a question, like what would Visual Studio do? Yes, now I can just go to statistics. Instead of getting instrumentation, I can go sampling. And that's very similar to what you would get there. But it's better because I can play that little trick there where I can limit the statistics to a range. And now I'm looking at that just on that range. It can do a lot of cool stuff because since it's actually sampling the call stack, if I right click here, look at that. We have a nice little uh, correspondence with assembly. And if we scroll here, it shows me some hotspots. So 14% of the time was spent on specific thing. Here's the corresponding assembly for that. You can go really, really deep on the micro level if you want to do analysis on, on this level. Another cool thing is like you can zoom in and I can see, do you see those little dots that are there? Those are the points where the CPU was interrupted. And I believe it was eight kilohertz. So this should be 125-ish microseconds. It shows you the call stack there when you hover over. If there is a red thing here, basically the thread is waiting. It tells you, okay, waiting. It was waiting for some synchronization object. You can, it, it can be very, very insightful. But it's like just this simple trace here is six, six gigabytes when decompressed, right? Does it capture the, the bone culture? Yes, if you are on Linux, you can, you will actually, you can select performance counters to be captured. The manual mentions that on Windows, if you use the Windows subsystem for Linux or Windows Linux, whatever that is, it will work. I tried, it didn't work, but I didn't break a sweat trying to make it work. But if you, if you know how to do that, please report back. I would be very curious to, to know that, right? Um, Self-referential formula. Um, okay, we have three minutes, so uh, what should I do next? Should we look at quickly a few study cases or? I, I will be around here, so if there's questions, I can always. Uh, so is this, uh, Tracy, uh, in active development? Or, uh, are there ways to contribute? Yes, it's an open source project. Again, on my first slide there, uh, you can just go there. Uh, it's an active development. Uh, it, you know, every week there is some commit or something being merged there, uh, so you can go and I encourage people to participate. Okay. Question here? Yeah. You have a second presentation. Can you share it? Uh, which one? Your presentation. Ah, definitely. I, it will be. It, that, that's a given, right? And there is a lot of extra material here that you can swift through. What is the, the overhead of each yeah, so again, uh, what I mentioned, maybe it was too quick when I mentioned, let me just disconnect this. Uh, the overhead is going to depend on the machine there. In this case, for example, this trace here, which was made on a Mac ARM, if you go to info and you go trace statistics, you see like these things called queue delay and time resolution. The manual explains, right? It's pretty high on an ARM. And I, even on my presentation here, I do have, um, at the very end, I actually added a little experiment here. Uh, I can show you here. So there's like a million events happening in um, about 141.6 milliseconds. There's like a million events. And if we look at the source code here, this is basically what Tracy does to determine that number that I showed you. It's just running like a loop like this to kind of determine the, the overhead. But on some machines, if I open a tra another trace here, let's say the, the Quake, which was captured on a Windows machine, you'll see that my, now my queue delay, this was captured on, a, there's processor information here, like a Xeon blah, blah, blah. You can see there's just eight, eight nanoseconds. And I, I've, seen three, I've seen four nanoseconds in some Intel chips. One minute and 30 seconds. Ah, yes, uh, that is a very simple thing to do. I can open the Quake trace that we saved from early. Um, Actually, the way you do is, um, I can explain here, you go to source. Uh, actually, I think maybe, maybe it was here. Actually, you know what? I 
happen to know the file. And it's... Uh, So you have frame mark start, frame mark end, if you want to do. If it's just a consistent frame that always has like a cadence to it, like a refresh thing, then you don't need, even need the begin and end. You can just do a, I'm sure I did somewhere here. It's just called frame mark. Maybe it's inside the client frame because the client frame actually renders Yeah, it's there. It's only one, right? So every time after a refresh, after a swap buffers, I just add a frame mark and it will automatically know. And then you can look at the different frames at the top here, see? Uh, I can navigate the frames and if I wanna see a server frame, I can click this and now I can navigate only the server frames or I can see only the client frames or I can see the actual render frames. So I encourage you to explore the tool. No, you don't need. The frame start and frame end is like when you, the, 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 uh, like uh, let's say that there is, um, uh, it's something that happens less occasionally and there is a very specific location. Maybe I can just do a frame start and end in a specific location to have it shorter. There will be maybe gaps between frames and a, a general frame, if you're doing like a rendering application, usually it makes sense to use the, just the frame mark, like on the rendering loop. We are already, out of time. Um, again, as I mentioned, there was a lot of material that I couldn't cover here, but I hope I got you excited about Tracy. I hope you will consider it, we'll give it a try, and I'm happy to hang around a little longer here and answer questions, or even we can look at some study cases or, or something like that. I don't know if the projectors will be still available. If you could do that, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you.